Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> my name is Lisa Ray, and um, I've actually just moved off the Android team at Google. I am currently focusing on wearables, which is why I'm here today talking to you guys. Um, so this presentation is going to be an overview of Android Wear, and then later today, um, we'll talk about um, design and rapid prototyping. And then last, if you're still around, still want to listen to me, then we'll do a code lab so that you guys can leave here with the skills to build your own Android app um, that will run on Wear, and you'll be completely set up with an emulator and a development environment. So let's get started. So what's wrong with this picture? Google's been spending a lot of time looking at technology usage, and we've been thinking a lot about ways to stay connected to the people around you and those that aren't with you. I don't need to tell you how useful phones and tablets are, and there are certainly a lot of great use cases for that. But Android Wear aims to complete that picture by helping you stay in the moment when it's appropriate, giving you useful information the moment you need it, and in just a glance. So let's look at that in a more technical way. This is your day with your phone. Notice the length of time it takes to pull out your phone, unlock it, go to what you want, and then you get lost in it for a little while. There are certainly times when you want to get lost in your phone, if you're on the subway, if you're waiting in line. But there's a lot of time and attention cost if you just want to feel connected when you're out and about, especially when you're with other people. So this is the same set of interactions on a wearable. But notice the reduced overhead per interaction. This is what's meant by more present in the real world and yet more connected to the virtual world. Now, what does that mean for your development? Well, to start with, and this is important, it's fundamentally different user interaction model. And you can tell just by looking at this device, it's fundamentally different from other mobile devices. So to really nail user experience, you've got to rethink it a little. When considering what features of your service that you'd like to make available on the wrist, consider this question. What couldn't we do on the phone that we can now do on the watch? What now becomes possible? And then focus on that. And also, um, you just got to try it. I highly recommend if you're going to publish an app on the store, get yourself a watch and see how it feels to you. It might sound silly, but putting that watch on, standing up when you try it out, you get yourself in the situation and you know what it feels like to use your service on the go. So here's an example of a very basic but essential difference. This is the app experience on the phone. We've trained users to collect these shiny objects and then search for them when they want to go do something, which works fine on a phone. But if we just put those same shiny objects on a wearable, then it'd be the same time-consuming time paradigm, but on a device that's designed to reduce that part of the interaction. It just doesn't make sense. So how do we get outside of this? How do we get away from this grid of shiny objects? So this is the Android Wear interface. It's simple, it's glanceable, and it's built around micro-interactions. And the interface is divided into two primary behaviors. You can talk to the wearable. You can think of it as taking different actions. So the user can say, OK, Google, and then any voice command is available to them. OK, Google, get me directions. And on the other hand, the wearable can talk to the user, not literally because it doesn't have a speaker, but it's giving you information. So you can think of this as a context stream. You can think of it like enhanced notifications that matter to the user right now because they're in the right time or place. So that's the basic framework that will set you up for success. But to really make it all the way there, you need to carry this philosophy into your application as well. By providing a connection to the world while respecting the user's attention, Android Wear feels personal as well as global. If you, it's simple, but it's also smart. So applications that respect these principles will feel most at home in the Android Wear experience. 
So wearable apps are aware of the user's context, their time, their location, the physical activity that they're doing. And apps use this information to insert cards into the context stream when they become relevant. And this makes Android Wear timely, as well as relevant, and very, very specific. A classic wristwatch is designed to let you see the time in just a split second, and then get on with what you are doing. And so it should be the same for Android Wear. The less time that it takes to use your software, the better your app is. The more time the user can be present in what they're doing. So very different from a normal app experience, where we can measure engagement as a good thing. And remember what we just looked at a moment ago? The wearable can talk to the user, and the user can ask things of the wearable. So you can visualize this a lot like a personal assistant. It knows you, it knows your preferences, and it only interrupts you when absolutely necessary. And it's always on hand to provide an answer. And it focuses on simple interaction. It only requires input from the user when absolutely necessary. And most inputs are based around touches, uh, swipes, and inputs that require fine-grained finger movement, choosing particular things on the screen should be avoided if at all possible. So keep these in mind as you dream up your Android Wear experience. So we'll get a little more technical here. There are two ways for you guys to make an Android Wear app. There's notifications, and there's what we're calling a micro app, an APK that's embedded inside your phone APK. So first, notifications. The notifications on your phone can also be displayed on the wearable. And to get this done, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> it already works out of the box. And also notifications that buzz or make a sound on your phone will also buzz on the wearable. So that's awesome. And enhanced notifications also show up on the wearable. So if you're implementing a lock screen control using the remote control client, Android Wear will automatically support this as well. And to get this done, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> it also already works out of the box. Um, there are three more features that you can also add to your notifications that take very little work, just a few lines of code. Um, stacks are like inbox style notifications, so you can deliver multiple items in a single bundle. Pages are for showing multiple pages of information on the same topic. Just remember to stay glanceable. You don't want them reading an entire email. Replies allow the user to reply directly using voice input. So that's it, that's notifications. And your other option is apps. So let's talk about apps. There are three main things that your app can do. And you're going to focus on sharing data between the phone and the wearable. There's a possibility of making your own custom UI. And also, you can integrate voice into your app. So the connection between phone and wearable is provided by Google Play services. This is great because it gets updated automatically. No waiting for the next version of Android to roll out. The application can send data between the phone and the wearable uh, through asynchronous calls to Google Play services. And there are three types of data exchange. The node API lets you know when devices are connected. The message API allows you to exchange low latency messages between the phone and wearable. And the data API gives you the ability to store data on the phone and it's automatically buffered when the devices are disconnected. So these three sort of work together. You'll probably use more than one. The node API can get connected nodes at any time. Uh, you'll be notified when a peer is connected or disconnected. The message API lets you send a message and be notified when one is received. And the data API lets you put and get data items and get notified when data has changed. So to receive data, you need the wearable listener service. Generally, you'll run this on both the phone and the wearable. But if you're only interested in receiving messages on one of them, for example, if you only need them on the, uh, the watch, in that case, you only need to run it on the wearable. 
You create a class that extends wearable listener service, and you listen for the events you care about, such as on data changed. And you declare an intent filter in your manifest to notify the system that you're running a service. And this lets it bind it as it's needed. So let's talk about custom UI. You can make custom notifications using a wearable UI library that we've provided. In general, you should create notifications on the phone and let them automatically sync to the wearable. This lets you build your notifications once and have them appear on multiple devices. But if the standard notification styles don't work for you, you have the option of building your own on the wearable. So this is new, this is interesting. Um, the system does not sync notifications that you make on the wearable anywhere else. They're only local. So if, you, if your micro app makes a notification, it's only there. So there's a UI library that helps you build UIs that are designed specifically for wearables. And it's automatically included when you create your wearable app using the Android Studio project wizard. But if you already have an app that you want to add it to, you can add this to your Gradle file. Um, it's just a support library. And it has some classes. Um, this is just a handful of them. A couple of my favorites are um, the dismiss overlay view. This is the view for implementing long press to dismiss. We've already built that for you. Watch view stub is an important class. In an Android app, we use resource folders to determine which uh, layouts we're going to pick depending on the form factor. In the watch, we use watch view stub instead, and it can inflate a specific layout depending on whether the wearable is round or square. Box inset layout is basically a frame layout, but it's aware of screen shape, and so it can box its children in the center, the square in the center of a circle. Really good for round screens. And finally, voice actions. So system provided actions are task based and they're built into the where platform and they're specified with an intent filter. App provided actions are app based and they're declared like a launcher icon. So you can see you would launch these by name. And then freeform speech input uses the speech recognizer activity to get input from the user. System provided voice actions, you filter them in the manifest in the activity that you want to start when the voice action is spoken. So like take a note, set an alarm, that kind of thing. And these are the commands that are available on Android Wear today. If you want one that's not in this list, um, you need a app provided voice action. And these voice actions, um, you declare them just like a launcher icon. Users say start to use these voice actions. And the speech recognizer, in addition to using voice actions to launch activities, you can also call the system's built-in speech recognizer activity to obtain speech input from users. So that's great for search or sending messages. So what's next? Obviously, our documentation is a great place to start. Um, I believe we're about to take a coffee break after this. And then we're going to jump into designing Android Wear apps. So thank you guys all for listening to me. Uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs>